Victorian Periodical Parade. <laughs> I was just up looking for my syphilis book. <laughs> I don't think, I think I must have moved it to my university-based office because I wanted to read a segment from it today so that I just at least give the credit. Let me try to just look up the table of contents at least. Sure, of that book. Yeah. Nice. I guess it's this one. I don't think so, though. What am I? Oh, this is going to bug me. <laughs> Let me look one other place. I might have the proofs on my computer. Okay. There we go. Yes, there we go. Okay. Nice. So, how have you been? I've been okay. This morning I threw up my neck a little bit playing with uh, Fiona, but other than that, it's all right. You got to get a better story. At our <laughs> age, it needs to be like a bar fight in a hockey bar or something. Okay. Mine are, my real stories are always like, I slept and then I woke up and my neck hurt. Right. So Fiona and I were playing ninjas and I did like a side flip roll through the bed and my neck was like, hey, that was too fast. <laughs> hey, you're in your 30s now. That doesn't <laughs> happen. Yep. Oh, yeah. We have replaced almost every appliance in our house over the last two weeks because hmm. from all we can tell, whoever built this did like replace them all at the same time or something and so they all broke like simultaneously wow yep so um new water heater new furnace new dishwasher and we repaired the dryer we didn't have yeah. to get a new dryer but we did get a new washer a couple months ago so it's pretty much everything but the microwave and the stove have been replaced at this point dun, dun, dun. oh god i shouldn't have said i know i shouldn't have said it <laughs> so once again i was able to find this exact journal article nice. shout out to british newspaper archive which i have a membership with it's through the british library which is like super legit and i think i pay like 13 dollars a month to have access to a really i was concerned that it would be two obscure irrelevant uh newspapers and magazines but it's really served me well when i came to whitworth where i work now i had gotten used to working with this archive called british periodicals mm. my former institution had it and i was just so used to being able to look up essentially do word searches and say like okay how frequently were people marketing cough drops in this decade <laughs> versus this decade and I could see graphs and it was just this handy tool and I'd become oh, really God. dependent on it and Whitworth doesn't have it and when I asked them to buy it access to this database I found out through them that it cost $36,000 a year wow subscription and so you know there's just no way that a small school like Whitworth is going to buy that when I'm literally the only person using it right right I mean, even at my previous institution, you still probably have five people using it. I mean, these there's a whole issue of like ethics of access to journal information and the cost that people charge for it and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I've been so happy with being able to just pay $13 a month to have access to this out of my, I mean, probably Whitworth would pay for it for me if I wanted them to, but I just haven't like asked. Anyway, I found um, this exact issue that our story for today was in through the British newspaper archives. So thanks to them for their very reasonable pricing <laughs> and letting me have access to that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it really is. And it, I think access is really important. I think it's a bit odd that we... <sighs> invest in professors doing this kind of research and then even like their own work we make it very hard to access right you would be surprised the number of articles that like i've written mm -hmm. that i can't actually access the pdf of. <laughs> yeah i have my word yeah. document you know but if i want it to look official and prove that it got published somewhere i have to like email the editors and they'll always give it to me yeah but it's like it's always often paywalled even to me to get Ugh. it so, yeah i don't know if you ever heard there was a guy years ago i want to say like 2013 maybe he hacked into jstor which is one of the biggest archival holdings of academic writing but he hacked it to make it just open to everyone because he was oh. trying to make a statement about how knowledge should be accessible mm -hmm. and they 
put him in prison for so, 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 so long. Like it was such an onerous prison sentence that they clapped back with that he killed himself in prison because he was just like a dude like you or I. Like he wasn't like a seasoned criminal. And I don't think he thought that they would retaliate in that way. Yeah. Um, But they are very proprietary about knowledge. So it's kind of a sad statement, I think. Yeah. And yeah, it's so weird that somebody does all this research and makes a paper and and says, hey, this is what I found out about, you know, this topic. And these are important results. We need to expound on them and add it to textbooks. But then, like you say, if it's hidden away and only people, if it's the people who are then writing the textbooks who have access to it, that's one thing. And then eventually five years down the road, the textbook will come out with that person's information in it. That's a long time. How long does it take you to research and write a paper? And to get out to the public, generally a couple of years minimum. Right, right. Yeah, I know. It's a real issue because I've seen through social media that we've had really good spread of discourse, inclusive discourse. I took my first class on disability theory in 2010. I never heard of it. Hmm. And now I see soccer moms on Facebook calling each other out for ableism. You know, these the spread mm-hmm. of knowledge is good. And I think it's actually why I've moved more into public facing writing, because I think there's some real ethical questions we should ask ourselves about playing any role in a system that says we should build knowledge and then not let just anybody right. have access to that. Yeah. For me, I will keep academically publishing just so that I maintain like credentialing, like so that I don't become just some rando who thinks they can talk about whatever. But that's why I've kind of moved away from it because yeah, it just feels, I mean, most people that go to a decent PhD program as well, it's, and don't get me wrong, I think professors and scholars are victims of the systems by and large, but we are not only victims, we also have agency. Our educations generally have been paid for. Generally, a PhD program comes along with free tuition and a salary. And so for me, you know, that's a huge privilege and to take that knowledge and not know in my lifetime immediately that I've done something to help the world around me with it. I just, I, I couldn't live like that. Now, granted, I mean, they make it hard. Like for instance, when I wrote my first academic book, academic presses, if you want an index and a good index is actually crucial to getting your book like used very much because people aren't going to read it cover to cover the the professor themselves pays for their own index and that's upwards of a thousand dollars if you want a good one whereas publishing in the more well-known you know retail publishers they do it for me like it's it's much honestly, like I feel like I get treated better, but then of course that's a for-profit system too. I mean, people are paying, you know, 15 bucks for a book they pick up at Target. So I don't know. It's not like I have all the answers. Um, Right. But it's the question typically that opens the door and it's like, should we, you know, hide all this knowledge or, you know, make it have to be paid for in so many ways? Yeah. Things do have a cost, but like, if I want to make one of my articles, like an academic article, open access, that anybody can read, I would pay two to $3,000 to make. And so it's like, why is that cost on me or even my institution? And and to me, there is a difference there between that versus like everybody paying $15, a digital article, maybe five, I don't know. But I know like when I try to find a paywalled academic article, generally it says I can access it if I want to pay $50. And that's egregious Hmm. it's highway robbery for a pdf digital file yeah at a certain point you made enough money for the pdf to become free yeah obviously i don't know all the like business models on the back end and how that works but yeah i think asking the question and doing what each of us can to be like at least let people know that's how it works you know Mm -hmm. like or you know telling people for instance in case they think the professor gets money for that article like no some third-party business does and maybe we should all have a problem with that right it's a good thing to think about be like so this money doesn't go back to the person who created 
this document there's like a system that's and does the system then protect that work and like exactly i i don't even know okay. and i'm in this is like i'm right. a part of this yeah and i think too the media when you see a professor portrayed in media they it's getting better but for a long time they were portrayed as like pretty affluent mm -hmm. and so i think there is this sort of sense just from your average person what they know like they must be making money through this like people right, always right. thought even academics like people that were in my grad program with me were like well you make money from like your side hustle with your books you're publishing and i was like oh my God, like you're going into this field and you're under the illusion, like no shade to them, but like that's how little we could expect your average person on the street to understand that the $50 for this article they want mm -hmm. is not going to the professor. We can't even expect aspiring professors to know that, you know, yeah. until somebody tells them. Right. Moving to the story, I really like this one. This might have been yeah. my favorite one yet. I think it's going to have a couple different Scottish accents. Oh, yeah. I go deep into accents. I enjoy like Bergensk dialect, which mm -hmm. is really difficult to understand until you understand it. Until like I've fallen into the full Scottish or full Irish where it's difficult to understand when you first start listening to people. But then I'm like, okay, so then they roll their R's like this, or they make this tone, or, you know, they don't say children, they say barn. And, yeah. you know, and they say can instead of no. Oh my God. Yeah. It never occurred to me until you just said that. <laughs> and I'm talking to you. Did you ever think about the similarity between Scottish barn and Norwegian barn? Because you mm -hmm. just said it with a Norwegian accent. And that like mm -hmm. triggered my mind in a way that I never yeah. thought of. I was rereading it and it came to window. And I was like, nope, nope. Uh, Scottish say vindu. And so I was like, let's pronounce that better. So yeah, should be fun. No. Do you think there's a linguistic connection? Oh, there? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Vindu is totally from the Vikings. And Bern is probably also Barn. It probably is because there's a lot of, even in the Canterbury Tales, mm -hmm. I had to memorize the first part of the prologue. And sure. um, have you ever read it? Did you ever do, no. you do that? No. Okay, I'll show you. It's really hard for some people, but even that, and that's middle English. It's not even old English. It right. is so similar to Norwegian. Like there are true <laughs> cognates. Hold on one second. I'll show you. Cool. I can't ever get anybody to care about this because they don't <laughs> care about Norwegian, but like, mm. it's so cool. Let's yeah. I, a good one. I think other people have told me to read Canterbury Tales, but I, I never know where to get it. Is yeah. there just PDFs online? Like some of this stuff or. I'm trying to find like what you want is the comparison. Hold on. <laughs> Canterbury Tales Prologue, original Middle English, side by side English. Oh. No, it exists. It's a thing that we do. Mm -hmm. No, Ugh, sorry, I'm not stopping till we do this. It's so fun. Good. But yeah, there even by the Middle English time there were still so many perhaps i think almost even more obvious cognates and connections because middle english is more similar to our modern english so we recognize it right oh my gosh this is pissing me off sorry canterbury tales original middle english Okay, well, I'll just show you this. I won't actually need to really translate it to you, but you can listen to how I pronounce it. It's just so cool because there are cognates with words you would never have expected with Norwegian and literally nobody would care except somebody who knows Norwegian and I've never right. had an audience for this. Okay, so this <laughs> is how you would say it. You'll hear it better then you'll it. see it yeah when the opera with the sure is sutta the drought of marsh had pursed to the rutta and bothered every vein in swish liqueur of which virtue engendered is the flour one's a fierce acre with his sweat a breath in spirit hoth in every halt and hath the tender croppers and the young sonna hoth in the ram his half course irona and smaller fowlers mocking melodia that sleep in all the nicht with open gear so that means when April with his sweet showers, so you see Sutta, mm -hmm. it's spelled different, but it is actually pronounced Sutta. Yep. It is an auditory cognate. The waters of March had pierced to the Rutta, mm -hmm. like bothered every vein and switched the cura, which where two is gendered as the Flur, which sounds Norwegian, even though it's 
not to yeah. modern Norwegian, might be older. And then the youngest son, yep. and the smaller fule. Mm-hmm. That's even like, it reminds me of like, all the fule, small de ar. Oh, it's just so cool to be like, that is Nor. it's basically Norwegian. <laughs> right. Especially in the sound. Yeah. I don't yes. know. Is this the way it was written? What I'm this saying? is the way it was written. So it kind of okay. reminds me of how like Swedish sounds so much like Norwegian, but doesn't look like it. Whereas right. like Danish looks like Norwegian, but doesn't sound like it. Let's see. You better keep a lot of this in there because I think it's fun. That's what um, I was thinking. Yeah, just go. Well, because we're kind of, eventually we're going to probably get kind of repetitive on some of the Victorian topics. So I think right. these little like Dang bypass this. into, yeah. So I can show you, I'm pretty sure that I'm not wrong about this, but um, it's possible that I've drifted towards a more, Norwegian pronunciation over the years but like we were told how to say this in my high school oh. and my memory is that it was it sounds exactly like Norwegian so let's see isn't it cool it's like it's Norwegian yeah it's pretty close the other thing is I think it also tips back to Germanic as well on the other mm. side and so it's um yeah it's splitting right down those yes I know it's I mean of course like anybody listening to this that speaks actual Norwegian will be like you're wrong because Norwegians are very literal but like right. <laughs> it's still a shocking resemblance and I think mm-hmm. one that at least in the fields of work that I've ever been in nobody cares about like the Norwegians I know don't care about Middle English and the people I know that speak Middle English don't care about its debt <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> I mean, there's probably people out there but just right. I haven't ever really met anybody right. that would talk with me about it because the people that you're talking about, are they Victorianists? Well, no, because okay. I don't think those people would care. But like even the are people that I know that are like Middle English, like medieval literature scholars, I just, I don't think I've encountered the people who... Right. Well, it's very niche. Yeah. Like, right? so they either probably do different things or, I mean, it could be that that's just so basic to them that they don't care. Maybe they're no longer fascinated by it. Or it could be that they don't really know Gomelnorsk. You know, mm. and so they're like, well, it's not Norwegian and it doesn't sound like Norwegian of today. And sure, I, I'm Norwegian, but I'm researching Middle English. I'm not researching Middle Norsk, you know, so mm-hmm. they're steps away. But I'm sure there's other people out there who are just perfectly in that niche. Yeah. Of course, finding that group is probably difficult because once you get so deep down a tunnel, you only find friends who are there and then it's hard to branch out. Yeah. It's hard well, to this is it circles back to the problem of having academia be so closed off. Yeah, yeah. Because then what ends up happening is people, without, I think, any intent in doing it, you end up producing scholarship that you work really hard for and that might reveal really interesting things, but only the other 15 people in your field end up reading it. Right. Because exactly. it becomes so siloed. And if we were more open with everything, I think the discourse would circulate and benefit all of us more. Right. Right. Okay. So in this story, I don't even know why we started talking about the Canterbury Tales. Sorry. Oh, because we were talking about Scottish accents and I'd yep. never thought about Bairn. And I'm mm-hmm. still going to actually look that up in the OED, the Oxford oh, English Dictionary. Okay. Cool. Because I'm curious. I am convinced that this comes from Scandinavian Old Norse roots. Yeah. And I never thought about it before. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very weird tangential pleasure of mine, linguistics. Yeah. Because it's like, I've gotten very deep on some linguistic topics, but they're so off to the side of everything else that it's like, ooh, that one word or that one thing, I can follow it through everything. You yes. Know? It's pretty cool. So here we go. Bam. Absolutely, we're right. All the way back to Barna. Oh my gosh. Right on the screen. Middle English, 1600s, Barna. Germanic, yep. Oh, look, it goes back even farther. Yeah, Old Norse, Danish, Swedish, Barn. Boom, middle Dutch. Talk about another source, like the OED. I can only access it through university libraries. Really? You can get a short version free, but like yeah. this kind of information is like locked away from people, which I don't think is fair. Yeah, I mean, with this kind of stuff, it is 
kind of more understandable that it has to have a cost because someone went through extensive research to go back to 1600s to oh yes they do they hire people right? too right. like they have employees who do this yeah. i just listened to a podcast episode where they were trying to track down the original the earliest written form of the word mullet and they interviewed all these oed scholars like yeah. and the work there orman look at this the plural barn 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 in orman is i don't know what orman is and i can't figure yeah. it out there was language 12th century work of biblical no. oh maybe that's just the source that they found this oh in orman yeah so this must be some like an old written source they have hence it is probable that the northern singular barn is as much of old norse as of old english origin there you go all the way back to beowulf look at that that's cool 529 yep so that's wow. 1500 years Cool. And it's even spelled more closely to Scottish in Beowulf, Bairn. Mm-hmm. That is really neat. Sometimes, not as much as you, but like sometimes there's a word that I'm like, I want to know. Yeah. And it is just so cool that like somebody has done this work. Yeah. To I be mean, like, whoa. I'm sure it's multiple people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. Okay. So this story is really cool because, well, I mean, I think we've seen this in some of the previous episodes, but in many ways, this reminded me of more of a more typical ghost story of like the right. more famous kind that I've read where there's like often a room that nobody goes in. It's like all the, honestly, kind of the stereotypes we have of ghost stories. A creepy room over there that people have abandoned and then new owners come and they're like, what's in here? And then they're like, oh, that's why nobody goes there. Yeah. Kind of a common thing in 1800s ghost stories. And I suppose, you know, still a popular framework for a story today. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, when I look back, the sister-in-law, Rhoda, is actually a rather unnecessary device in here. I mean, I guess she does kind of push the the woman, yeah. the narrator, to take the room, but anybody could have done that, the nurse or whoever. Well, but I don't know. I think the way it sounded, the nurse was just in her routine and helping, and it sounded like Rhoda was coming in as a presumed wedge or you know she's this strong woman who's going to come in and just do her own thing and then she was really good with the kids and so that was like the narrator was assuaged and she was like okay well this will be fine and then once Rhoda had won over Jack the narrator was like oh well this person is amazing and just like flipped her preference mm -hmm. of her and then she was like you know what I'll take care of the kids these older kids you go rest up away and I think that was because I don't really remember a reference from like the nurse or the husband ha having said you should go into the into the back room over there and be safer so i think she might have just been that extra push yeah it's just an interesting choice of device to have right. that push come that way like yeah not from the husband who is absent throughout the story right um, well but he's absent I mean, yeah but like, these are all choices the author made, right? right so right. it's interesting to be like, why did she choose to strut? Well, or at least to note, not necessarily to question, but like, okay, she chose to structure this story completely through female energy. Yeah. And remember that thing in the last episode, we talked about homosocial desire and same sex bonds. And so it's an interesting choice to me that the choice here, the husband, I mean, this is all fiction, right? So yeah. the author didn't have to make the husband go away to Scotland because yeah. of an uncle who is super, super sick when it's like, okay, well, your wife's about to be super, super sick and have a baby. Yeah. But instead, she decides that this is going to be occurring in a female space. It's just interesting to note and you kind of learn about the author, I think, and their priorities when you mm -hmm. notice little things like that. I wonder if she was also noting a typical occurrence because in the Victorian era, did men just go off to do manly duties or certain works and then said, well, there's a nurse and I have my sister. The women will all take care of the newborn baby and then I'll come back and the baby will be born or maybe the baby won't be born. I think this book indicates or the story indicates that that depended on the oh. husband and wife. 
Because okay. he doesn't want to leave, right? right? He's like, I'm a really solicitous, caring husband, and I want to say, but like deep down, you know, like I'm going to go. I think it just depended. I mean, I think okay. there would have been really callous, mean husbands that were never around. And yeah. I think there would have been super controlling husbands or very concerned ones that were right there. Um, right. So yeah, I, I just think all we can say is that that's a choice that yeah. Lucy Hardy made to say like, this is just going to be a story about like women making the decisions. And, mm -hmm. and all we can deduce from that is that she cared about showing spaces in which women make decisions and yeah. or found men somewhat irrelevant to the story. Mm -hmm. And if we look back, right, like the last story, it is circulating around a dead brother, but it's all about the woman. Mm -hmm. The story before that was mostly about a man discovering that dead baby in his yeah but you can make the argument that really what structures that story is the dead woman yes and then the first one we did mm. oh it was about the the man that hid in the bag yep that one i would say equally involved men and women but like so i think there's a trend of her sort of cutting the man out of these processes yes. not yeah, always but often say. Yeah. Well, he was tied up in a bag and she was like, I have to protect my grandmother. Mm. My dad is going away. And then her future husband comes and then runs away. And so she's still sitting there all night with the dude. And yeah. they come and take him off and they catch his buddy. And and he's literally marginalized the whole text. Like he's in a cupboard yeah. where yeah. she's keeping him off yep. to the side. Yeah. So I think that's interesting, like getting to know this author and saying like, okay, these are the trends that she seems to work with. The other thing that I thought was interesting about this story, I think this will be my only other point, is that there is a belief in the Victorian era through the end of the century that a woman's emotional state during her pregnancy mm. marks the pregnancy. So here is where I'm going to read from Livia Woods. She wrote an essay for a book that I co-edited on syphilis as part of the other things she was saying about syphilis. This point that I'm about to make has nothing to do with syphilis, <laughs> but I want to say it's called impressions, but impressing, imprinting. <laughs> oh, sure. So the very common example in the Victorian era that this author of this this article not Lucy Hardy is that for instance if a woman was craving strawberries during pregnancy like you needed to give her strawberries because if she didn't get it that craving would be marked on the baby in the form of a strawberry birthmark right oh Wow, that's funny. Yeah, and so particularly in terms of pregnancy cravings, but also fears that the, the yeah. woman was feeling. And so I'm nearly certain that the subtext that a 2021 audience might easily miss here is that the baby died and she almost died, in my opinion. The, the message that would have been very clear to another audience is that that was from the fear and dread and like uh, almost marking of death on that baby from right. staying in those rooms. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could read it as a literal like mark of death, but they definitely also would have had more of a sense to that just like shock at all during pregnancy could harm the woman and baby. So right. you could read it very, very literally, like they're taking the idea of like a birthmark and making it like literally the mark of the reaper. Mm -hmm. I believe they even mentioned the reaper here, don't they? Yeah, I think at the very end they were talking uh -huh. about. Yes. It was the younger, not the older life, which the reaper death gathered at last. So there is this sort of hint of like, it's literally the hand of death marking the baby, like the imprint of the craving would have marked a baby. But also they really did think that like just a really bad shock or fear, fearful moment during a pregnancy could harm the fetus. So mm -hmm. that's the thing that kind of goes under the radar. And if you want to talk about this as, I mean, you could read it so many different ways that like her initial, the narrator's initial foreboding of her sister-in-law we could see that as accurate because it's the sister-in-law that pushes her yeah. to do this thing mm -hmm. that actually ends up she kind of ignores her female intuition and that gets her into harm with her pregnancy and yeah. and we see her perhaps naively still loving that sister-in-law at the end conversely i think you could see it as a sort of 
female empowerment story of like just a space where there aren't men and yeah and babies died all the time and yeah so i'll read a bit from this issue and then i'll read the answers to last week's riddles they're they're showing me like all the different pages so i'm trying to figure out which page i want to read cough lozenges greater britain Hmm. greater britain i'm going to see what the british were saying about themselves in the 1890s (laughs) Oh, here's a poem that I randomly found out the other way about (laughs) there was a big wax dolly once who owned a little girl with lovely eyes that opened wide and golden hair in curl at first by her delightful toy the dolly set great store but presently she let her drop head downward on the floor (gasps) and shortly after that they say dolls are a thoughtless race the empty-headed thing forgot to wash her plaything's face she Mm. left her sitting all alone neglected and forlorn her hair had not been combed for days her pretty Mm. frock was torn the dolly's mother said if that is how you treat poor pearl it's very clear you don't deserve to have a little girl creepy oh this is common uh i had a friend in grad school who did a paper Uh, she studied victorian domestic arts and objects and she actually did a paper on victorian dolls and the way that newspapers would publish things about often kind of like elf on a shelf yeah like things about the doll surveilling the kid and watching them and knowing when they're bad and so this Uh. is in a similar weird victorian genre of like how would you like it if your doll treated you this way? Like, you should take more care of your dolls, little girls. I mean, it is definite reverse psychology. It's mm-hmm. like, if you make your doll mad enough, it's going to own you and treat you the way you treated it. So if you break your doll, you know, your doll or another doll is going to break you. And that's... It's, it's, it's like, yeah. at first you're like, great, teach them empathy. And then you're like, oh God, like yeah. in Victorian England, dolls break you. <laughs> yes, see, there you go. <laughs> then after that, I'm going to read this thing. It's a little article called Words with a History. Since mm. we were just talking about Perfect. the history of words. Goodness. Here we go. Villa formerly meant farm and not a house. Hmm. Daisy was originally the eye of day or day's eye. Hmm. Girl formerly signified any young person of either sex. Hmm. I wonder if that's true. Yeah, that's interesting. Hag once meant an old person, whether male or female. Hmm. Gallon was originally a pitcher or jar, no matter what size. (laughs) <laughs> voyage was formerly any journey whether by sea or land it did mm. not matter mm. polite at first meant polished and was applied to any smooth shining surface yes i've read that i've, what? Read, this, I've read sentences about you know the polite cutlery or something what yeah. that's neat that is cool yeah Goodbye is an abbreviation of the old English form of parting. God be with you until we meet. Yep. What? I can't remember who told me about that. Well, I can't remember who told me about it, but I think I was thinking about farewell and there were like threads going on about farewell and and everything. Oh, yeah. Farewell, like be well. Yeah. And Godspeed. The movie The Rock with uh, Sean Connery. Oh, I don't know. Nicolas Cage's character has uh, a last name. That's like Godspeed, but it's it's even another version. And so it's like, shoot, I don't remember it. But it's similar to that. Yeah, goodbye and Godspeed and all those things are very slightly different and changed today, but they mean very similar things. Hmm. Some of these I want to like look up and maybe instead of the riddles today, I think I want to like look up a couple of these that I'm skeptical of in the sure. dictionary that I have open. Meat meant once any kind of food in one old english edition of the lord's prayer the well-known petition is rendered give us this day our daily meat Mm. so it meant any kind of food that's what it says i'm gonna look that one up i don't know if i believe it (laughs) the next section on the next column is american humor Ooh, that sounds fun it's all just humor i wonder why it's american what's the first one Some of the world's finest literature is out of print, remarked the bibliophile. 
That's right, replied the poet. I can't get an editor to touch my productions. <laughs> <sighs> I don't feel like they had a good opinion of us. Because right. that's well, not funny. <laughs> well, it's only 100 years after the war. Small Marjorie had just been stung by a wasp. I wouldn't have minded it walking all over my hand, she said between her sobs, if it hadn't sat down so hard. And that's still humor. It's a, it's in the column label. It is it is labeled American humor. Yeah. I decline to call it that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. They had a certain. I mean, the views that the Victorians had about Americans are not as like cut and dry as you would think, but they're hard for me to get a hold of. It wasn't uniform either. Like different authors would claim like different things, and it almost feels to me when I read Victorian authors talking about Americans that I, I'm i too American to understand the very minute things that they're sensing about right. us. Um, I kind of feel like that Sting was kind of Southern, like a plantation girl from the Carolinas might have said that. I don't know what's giving me that vibe, but it feels like that's... I wouldn't have minded it if it was just walking around yes, on my own, it said, but when it sat uh, down too hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the main thing I see in fiction about them is that Americans, we, and, and this is still true, that we don't have the sort of reverence for tradition, you know, yeah. because we're newer and like we don't have dukes and duchesses and titles. And, but like, yeah. other than that, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the fact that it's called American humor could mean something as simple as they have an American columnist writing that column. Like, it, it's hard to really know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so here's Daisy. Daisy is one that I was a bit skeptical of. Sure. Oh my God, they're not kidding. Wow. Middle English, yep. Daisy's eye. Wow. I mean, I didn't necessarily think they were totally lying. Like, honestly, the Victorians had a pretty good handle on a lot more than we would realize. But yeah. also, yeah. sometimes they claim really weird things. Yes, so I like to for check. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, which one do you want to look up? Girl. Uh, girl. Girl, yeah, I'm curious yeah. about that. Okay. Wow. That's fascinating. Okay. Okay. There's a verb for girl too. I know. Isn't that weird? That, that sounds interesting. Show more. Oh, girl Show with more. an E. Get a lot. Gale. Well, that's Caribbean. Oh my gosh. There's a whole lot here. Yeah. Is there a part that says Whoa. why? Chiefly for a child of either sex, a young person, <gasps> or Irish English, Wexford, maid. Whoa. But that's how is that it's such a it's odd paragraph. that that's the first definition because that's not how we use it now well there's two ones there there's an i senses relating to a person yeah and then this is a sub point yeah chiefly so the first sub point is either sex and then the second oh okay that is okay they are not lying to us in this no. wow oh okay. language well but now, that's that's another big thing before the printing presses came around you know, you mostly just put down words that you personally thought went together. It sounded nice. Right. Okay, so this is the one, and I need to find, I think I might have. I also love all this artwork, like the, the lettering that they do sometimes uh, in, in block letters, and it's pretty cool. Oh, I know. The fonts and stuff can be yeah. so fun. Okay, it's always after whispers from women's world. I've learned that. Cool. Which is a long section. Mm -hmm. So it's about 70 pages for that month? Oh, yeah. This I almost think it's closer to 100 because I was on 480 oh, before. There it is. Answers to August puzzles. It Four was persons go for a walk around the park. They walk, One walks at five miles an hour, one at four, one at three, one at two. The path is one third of a mile. They start at noon and agree to go home to lunch when they all meet for the third time at the park gate. And apparently they would have met at 1 p.m. <laughs> what is the keynote to good manners? Be natural. Uh -huh. oh <laughs> That's good. That's so cheesy. Well, um, but what English word contains the letter I five times? You said Mississippi. That but I don't think guess. that's correct. No. Invisibility. Uh, okay. Sweet. When were walking sticks 
first introduced, oh my God, when Eve presented Adam with a little cane. Oh my God. That's so Wow, bad. that is corny. They needed some TV. Oh. Why is a telegram like a river? Because it owes its motion to a current. Okay, that's clever. I'll that's really that. good, yeah. When does a lady consider the rain too familiar? When it pats her on the back. <laughs> <laughs> i like it because it's punny yeah. and prude <laughs> yeah yeah pretty good thanks for meeting me <laughs> well but that's life life is a bouncing ball on a clock cool okay. bye bye thanks again for tuning in to the victorian periodical parade this is part two please tune in to part one the west room an unresolved mystery we're back on the monthly installments of the short stories of Catherine Lord. These have been edited down by Johnny Maines. So on whatever podcatcher you're currently using, make sure you hit that notification button that lets you know when our newest episode comes out. Check out Instagram for all of our posts and related content there. Have a great day. See ya. Victorian Periodical Parade. Victorian Periodical Parade.